this bill to the House. The question is that the motion be agreed to. I call the Honourable Louise Upston. Uh, thank you, Madam Speaker. And National, of course, uh, did recognise the need to rewrite and update this bill. Uh, after 80 years, uh, a significantly complex piece of legislation. And I also want to commend uh, the Honourable Anne Tolley, uh, as she was the minister that did the very, very heavy lifting um, to put this piece of legislation into a more workable order so that it was a more user-friendly. Um, so it is unfortunate that I stand as the first speaker on the national side to say that we will not be able to support this legislation um, because of the farce of a process that this government undertook with a 500-page SOP dumped literally hours before the second reading um, and refused any ability for the public to be consulted. Um, for the minister to say that she valued the input of 121 submitters in the select committee process is a farce uh, when she turns around and does that to them. So the second reading was on the 2nd of May. Even if that SOP, that significant, had had two weeks, there was plenty of time between now um, the 19th of July, 19th of September for our final reading. Uh, and when we, you know, we hear all these platitudes about this government being the most open and transparent, yeah, right. Um, one of the debates in the House, and, and this side of the House did try very hard to improve the legislation with a number of SOPs that were tabled in the committee stage. But one of the government's own SOPs, number 49, the minister in the chair, even having dumped it on the House at short notice, refused to even answer one question, which is an absolute outrage for the process uh, in this House. Uh, Madam Speaker, I want to just also say it's a significantly lost opportunity. And I want to speak about uh, the lost opportunity because uh, many of those minor amendments were all around enabling those frontline work and income officers to uh, better serve the people who are in front of them. And so that's just the ultimate contradiction when the Minister talks about wanting to have a work and income that is more caring and compassionate. Well, Minister, you've actually got to give them some tools. And this is the opportunity that you had as the Minister to give them some tools and you completely avoided that opportunity. So it is a lost opportunity. And it is the most vulnerable New Zealanders that will pay the price of that. And it's, it's interesting that the Minister in charge of this legislation that's now split into three bills is also the minister responsible for the Social Investment Agency. So it's pretty dire. Nearly a year into this government's term, a third of the way, and they still don't understand what social investment is. They still don't understand it. So the principle that was put into this piece of legislation was about the most vulnerable New Zealanders. The families, the individuals that have the most complex and challenging lives that National, when we were in office, actually believed. We wanted to serve them better than the system was serving them today. And so the government, the Labour-led government, has removed that opportunity. And it says those who are at the risk of long-term welfare dependency, MSD may identify appropriate assistance support and services. Why wouldn't the government want to do that? Why would the government not want to provide the individuals and families in this country who are the most vulnerable better support, better services, better funding? So it's very practical. It's about changing the lives of New Zealanders that probably everyone in this House worries about. Well, at least this side of the House does. And it's about enabling and ensuring people have the opportunity to lead better lives, to be able to move past what are incredibly difficult circumstances, uh, to lead lives that look quite different. So I just wanted to touch on, uh, Madam Speaker, some of the very practical changes that the government's ripped out of this legislation. And there was a lot of work that had gone into this piece of legislation before they turned up. One of them, one of them, it's just an absolute no-brainer. So, unfortunately, 
uh, in some circumstances, we will have um, families that are separated and both have a requirement um, to seek support or benefits as sole parents. They're both parents are uh, looking after children from that family. And the simple change with the split care scenario was to, to allow both sole parents to apply for and get the sole parent benefit. Bit of a no-brainer, really. Oh, no, but the Labor-led government have decided that that's not a practical solution. Instead, you would deny the financial support of one of those parents and not allow them to get financial assistance through the sole parent benefit. How is that helping the most vulnerable families? How is that helping a family in need when you deny the opportunity of a parent who is a sole parent applying for the sole parent benefit? Absolutely ridiculous. Absolutely crazy, crazy change. Particularly from a government who bleats on about putting children at the centre of everything. Well, this was a lost opportunity. The government could have made it easier on those children, but decided not to. Another practical example that, again, actually speaks to the heart of child-centred policy was the, com the combining of the orphan's benefit and the unsupported child's benefit, pretty much putting them into one benefit, giving it a new name. Actually, a name that's far more positive and meaningful. It would have made it the supported child's payment. But no, that was too much. That was too much of a stretch uh, for the government to think of um, that particular change, which introduced a new uh, single rate of sole parent support uh, and actually meant that those who are caregivers for orphans, uh, for supported children, would get the same entitlements and the same access uh, that other sole parents do. So again, very, very minor amendment, an opportunity to actually make it easier for the life of a parent, um, in this case a foster parent who is looking after a child, um, but no, that was too much as well. Uh, the third change, again, very unusual one that the government would dump, is a change in the name of the emergency benefit to the exceptional circumstances benefit, which actually reflects what it is. Um, it is about exceptional circumstances. So part of that was clarification, and this whole process for this legislation was about making the legislation easier, making it more simple to use, making it more user-friendly for working income staff, for policy makers, as well as, of course, for customers. But no. The government couldn't accept that change as well. And in terms of the process, I, I referred to the fact that it's hardly been an open and transparent process uh, when a significant SOP, 500 pages, is dumped an hour before a select committee, uh, before a second reading, I'm sorry. And this is the social security legislation covers $25 billion a year of taxpayers' money. $25 billion a year. So to the minister in charge, two weeks, two weeks you could have given and provided the opportunity for consultation. In this House, the minister in charge of the bill could have answered questions on the bill, could have answered questions on the SOP 49, which in her mind obviously didn't even warrant any answers, which I think, Madam Speaker, is a disgrace. When you're talking about the scale of funding that this particular legislation will govern $25 billion, this parliament and the people of New Zealand deserve openness and transparency. But, Madam Speaker, that's a bit of a common thread of this government, Labour-led, coalition, New Zealand first-led, whatever we call it these days. What we do know, it's definitely not open and transparent. And unfortunately, this is now a bill we can't support because this is a government that actually didn't take the opportunity to support the very people we're all supposedly here to serve. I call the Honourable Pini Hinare. Tēnākwe, Madam Speaker, and thank you for the opportunity. I rise in support of the third reading of this particular bill, and I do want to acknowledge um, both yourself, Madam uh, Speaker, and of course uh, my colleague, the Honourable Carmel Sepuloni, for the hard work.